God and my Father, my God and my strong son. I think at this time it would be very proper if we would recognize the delegates here from the conference that took place down at Purdue in, down in Indiana, who are here visiting us. And I know of no one who knows these delegates better than our own national secretary of the Farmers Union. So at this time, I'm going to call on Tony Deschamps. He's always ready to help out in a pinch to introduce our friends from across the seas. Tony Deschamps. Thank you very much, Chairman Upsall. In introducing the guests, our international visitors here this evening, I'd like to do it by country. And I'd like to ask the members of each delegation to stand and uh, to conserve time, let's withhold applause until each country, till the representatives of each country have been uh, presented and then we'll give them a hand country by country. And first of all, I'd like to present the Indian delegation. They're here uh, through the work of the Foreign Agricultural Service of the Department of Agriculture. And I'd like to have these people stand. Mrs. Sybil Kahn. Mrs. Kahn, Mr. Deshmukh, Colonel Dillon, Mr. Neswi, Mr. Niji, Mr. Patel, Mr. V. V. Patil, Mr. H. G. Patil, Mr. Ram Krishan, H. T. Reddy, J. R. Reddy, Mr. Sharma, B. P. Singh, Ratan Singh, Mr. Ski Ram, Ram Lula. I came pretty close, Mr. Ski Ram Lula. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. Mr. and Mr. Varma. All right, they tell me to get closer to the mic. Can you hear me better now? Let's give this delegation from India a hand. I'd like now to present Mr. Nefti from Iraq. Mr. Nefti from Iraq. He's over here and let's give him a hand. The technical advisor for this delegation is Dr. Adair Hodges, and I'd like to present him. Dr. Hodges, are you with us? One of our Indian representatives uh, is ill, and I believe Dr. Hodges decided to go to the hotel early. Now the IFAP delegates like, first of all, to present, and these, alpha, these are by countries alphabetically, Mr. Williams of Australia. Right up here, right up here. I want to stress that all of these people are leaders in their respective countries, and I'm not going to attempt uh, to try and uh, give their positions or the organizations that they represent. They are leaders in their respective communities, in their respective countries, uh, and we're delighted to have them with us. Uh, Mr. Lemoyne of Canada. The delegation from Denmark, Mr. Pinstrup, Mr. Larson, and Mr. Knudsen. Right here in front. Mr. Viko Ahamutilo of Finland. Right back there. Mr. Mamoru Hirakawa of Japan. Right over here. Mr. and Mrs. F.H. Sprott of Kenya. 
Over here. Mr. Burns of Luxembourg. Matthias, over here. And the delegation from the Netherlands, Mr. and Mrs. B. W. Bichevel, Mr. F. W. J. Quillars, Mr. and Mrs. C. S. Notnuris, and Dr. Friedema, right out here. <laughs> IFAP President John Andrew of New Zealand. Halvard Eike of Norway, right back here. The South Africa delegation, Mr. and Mrs. J.G. Grubler, Mr. and Mrs. A.E. de Villiers, and Mr. Muhlman, South Africa. The delegation from Sweden, Mr. Ed Blum, Mr. Swenson, Mr. Benz, Mr. Grabo, and Mr. Swardstrom. Right over there. Mr. and Mrs. Ernest Yagi of Switzerland. Right over there. Mrs. Yagi over there and Mr. Yagi over here. Someone back here says why? They're practicing international goodwill. The United Kingdom delegation, Sir James and Lady Turner. <laughs> and the rest of the dele delegation, Mr. and Mrs. J.K. Knowles, Mr. and Mrs. F. Scott, and Mr. Weingarten, and right back there. <laughs> Mr. Dmitry Bajalisha of Yugoslavia. Right here. And Rosemary Miller of our IFAP staff headquartered in London. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony Deschamps. He does a very thorough job, and I'm sure he hasn't forgotten anybody. I'm going to ask Ross Cummings, president of the State Grange, also to come to the platform, and Mr. Ratcliffe, president of the Beetle County Grange, to please come to the, uh, the Farm Bureau, please, to come to the platform. Uh, I forgot to mention uh, the wonderful cooperation we've had from the Daily Plainsman here in Huron. They've given us a lot of publicity and help in putting over this program today. We have indeed a, a grand array of speakers on the platform here this evening for this gala event. And I'm sure you're all anxious and waiting to hear from those people on the platform. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, which comes to us from Sweden. He's a delegate from that country to the International Federation of Agricultural Producers that was held at Lafayette. It's K.F. Swardstrom. He's a professor of the university in Sweden. <clears throat> That's located at Uppsala. He's also an advisor to the Swedish cooperatives in that nation or in that country. And I know of no nation in the world that has gone further in the, in the uh, movement of the cooperatives than Sweden. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to introduce to you at this time Professor Swardstrom 
of Sweden. Thank you. Uh, well, I have been asked to uh, tell you something about the Uni United Nations. Stand a closer to me. And uh, I do not quite know how to start. The subject is a rather comprehensive one. But uh, let me try it this way. Uh, one very old conception of paradise is the lamb resting beside the lion. Or, to avoid confusion, the lambs resting uh, at the side of the lions, as there are many lambs and lions in the world. Well, this is a true picture. Uh, if all the creatures had enough of food, it would be peace on earth amongst the creatures. Nobody wanting anything more, and the lamb uh, resting peacefully at the lion's side without fear for the lion taking his food from the lamb's body. In this respect, the story ends, as at least somebody of you might know, with the words, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, which perhaps it is a little more of vegetarianism than we can hope for in the near future. I should not have told you this story if it had not had a reference to you all and to man mankind at large. Some slight modifications are, of course, necessary. It might be more difficult for some of us to eat meat than for the lion to eat straw. Uh, it is definitely more difficult for mankind to be at peace even when there is no hunger than it is for the animals. However, sufficient food contributes to peace. That is the object of the FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organizations, uh, one of the members of the United Nations uh, family. And that is the challenge of the IFAP which you might have, which you have heard of very much today, the International Federation of Agricultural Producers, when pressing on FAO and its many governments to achieve its aim. Now, for mankind, uh, peace is not only sufficient food, it, in, in its broadest interpretation, but also rights and justice in their manifold conceptions. Every one of us is prepared at the bitter end to fight for both food and justice and also for peace. In this respect, the human being is neither a lamb nor a lion, but both amalgamated in one. The lamb obeying national laws about how to live and how to pay taxes, and the lion, when called upon as a soldier, to kill and destroy. None of us, I suppose, has as yet ever been able to bring into complete harmony these two contrasts, regenerating, it seems, one in the other. Still, even here, there must be a harmony. We know it because there is friendship in the world, because wider knowledge means understanding, which is the beginning of friendship and goodwill to negotiate instead of to fight. Knowledge, understanding, and negotiation about national rights and conceptions of justice are the aims of other members of the United Nations family, the aim of the United Nations itself. When you send delegates 
to this and other international bodies, you yourself se send them there as in a twofold capacity to contribute to understanding and peace and to fight for your rights. You might ask how that could really be managed to fulfill the duties in these two fields. I think if we ask men of experience, say the Secretary General of the United Nations, United Nations or any Secretary General of such an, an organization, he would give you this answer. To work with honesty and determination, and just that, to work with honesty and determination, whatever the day-to-day -day situation and problem might be. That, my friends, uh, is some few remarks concerning the United Nations, which I should like, like to bring uh, at your, to, your, to the, remember you of this great evening. And may I finish by saying that we from, from Scandinavia has been very happy to be with you this wonderful day. Och om det är någon som förstår skandinaviska vill jag gärna sluta med att säga att vi alla från Skandinavien är mycket lyckliga att få vara tillsammans med er idag. Thank you very much, Professor Swadstrom. I'm sure we have people in this audience tonight that understood the the finishing phrases of his talk to us. We're also very fortunate to have with us a former Secretary of Agriculture, a secretary that worked constantly in behalf of family farmers and was very much concerned that they should be dealt with fairly. So we're very fortunate to have with us tonight Charles F. Brannan, and I'm sure he wants to have a word of greeting and a few words to these good people here tonight. Charles Brannan. Paul Upsall, President Paul Upsall, distinguished guests, and my friends in South Dakota and our visitors, uh, you have a, on this platform a group of very distinguished and able people. And it would be an error on my part if I took any appreciable time in this program this evening. So I'm only going to say to you that I'm happy to be in South Dakota again. I'm happy to be sharing the platform with these very wonderful leaders of agriculture. And I have had one of the grandest experiences any individual could have as I have traveled along with our visitors from other lands uh, here today. This is a, a great occasion for all of us. It certainly has been a most pleasant one for me. Thank you, Paul, and thank everyone else. Thank you very much, Charles Brannan. We were very happy that you could spend this day with us. We had a very pleasant surprise the other day when we had a telephone call from Washington that the congressman of our first district was going to be in South Dakota. And of course, he wouldn't miss an occasion of this kind to greet the people of District 1 in particular, whom he represents in Washington. We're proud of the record that our congressman is making in Washington. We know from the record so far that he certainly, his interests are with the farming people and the rank and file of the people in the district that he represents in Washington, D.C., in the Congress. So, Congress McGovern, we're very happy you're here, and we're certainly not going to let you get away without saying a few words to this grand audience tonight. Congressman McGovern of District 1. Uh, Chairman Upsall, distinguished guests here on the platform, and delegates from all the great nations that are represented here this evening, and my South Dakota friends. 
I uh, certainly want to agree with our chairman here this evening that I welcome the opportunity to meet here even briefly with the folks that are gathered for this wonderful meeting this evening. I uh, had a, an opportunity just before leaving for Washington uh, late in December to make a talk in my hometown at Mitchell and I remember telling the some 200 people that came out for that farewell dinner that there were two fundamental objectives that I intended to dedicate my interests and my time and efforts toward at, uh, during my career in Washington. First of all, uh, the establishment of a prosperous agriculture, and secondly, to work for a peaceful world in these, any small way that I could. And it's a wonderful thing to come here to a meeting where those two themes form the center for your conference activities. For many years, I have believed that there is a direct relationship between the cause of world peace and the cause of an abundant agriculture, not only in the United States, uh, but across the world. I have just had the privilege in recent weeks of traveling in the Middle East. I was glad to see one of the delegates from Iraq uh, here tonight. This is one of the countries that I had the privilege of visiting where many hopeful and wonderful things are taking place. And it's wonderful to see the uh, kind of progress that is being made in that part of the world that uh, has not had some of the development opportunities that we've enjoyed uh, here in the United States, but which is now uh, moving ahead with uh, leaps and bounds in the development of their resources, the development of their agriculture, uh, toward the end of playing a greater and more uh, productive role in the life of the nations of the world. I couldn't help but think, uh, as I was sitting here a few minutes ago, looking out over this audience, that uh, a meeting like this would have been impossible uh, 20 years ago in South Dakota. I can remember as a high school debater at that time, uh, we were assigned the topic resolved that the United States and Great Britain should form an alliance. And I was on the negative side of that question with a vengeance. It seemed to me at that time that we had no business uh, meddling in the affairs of other countries and that we had plenty to do here at home and that what was going on in other parts of the world uh, was of no concern of ours. Well, it was only a very few years after uh, we completed our discussion of that debate question uh, that I found myself, along with millions of other Americans, uh, involved in a great conflict, which in large part was caused by that very negative attitude, that feeling that uh, the problems of other peoples in various parts of the world are of no concern to us uh, here at home. But we know now that problems that exist anywhere in the world affect uh, all the rest of us. And the cry of a, of a hungry child in India or Egypt or wherever it might be is a cry that we dare not let go unheeded because if we do, uh, we shall find ourselves once again uh, confronted with the same kind of uh, world crisis that brought so much grief to the world uh, in recent years. One of the first uh, occasions that I had in my own life to examine some of the uh, prejudices that had limited my effectiveness as a citizen occurred about 12 years ago, well actually about 13 years ago, and I've uh, told some of you folks of this experience that made such a lasting impression on me. Uh, at that time I was uh, flying as a member of a bomber team from the United States, and we uh, had assigned to our mission that day a group of Negro American pilots. This was a crack squadron of hand-picked uh, Negro Americans who were flying one of their first uh, missions in the Second uh, World War. And at that uh, stage in my life, I suppose I had much the same attitude toward people of uh, a little different skin color or different religion or different uh, uh, national background of my own that is characteristic of so many of us. And I 
remember that on this particular day, we ran into very serious difficulty over our target area, and our plane was badly crippled. We found ourselves dropping out of the formation. Well, we were told that these uh, Negro American pilots would be up there to take care of us and to fly protection for us so that we could get back home if anything went wrong. But lo and behold, we couldn't find them anywhere in the skies at that time. And I started to say some pretty harsh things uh, over the radio system. And just about the time uh, we were about to give up and we had uh, said all the uh, uh, things that we could think of to say of an unkind nature about these uh, Negro colleagues of ours, I heard uh, what I think is the most musical phrase that's ever come to me in my lifetime. When uh, over my earphones I heard a, the words of this Negro squadron leader and he said, well, something like this, uh, white boy, uh, why don't you shut up? We're all going to take you home. And I shall never forget that as I sat there in this big uh, bomber and watched these uh, Negro friends of ours hovering above and giving us protection and taking us safely home, that the thought uh, occurred to me, I think uh, for the first time in my life in a, in a real way, that after all, uh, when we're up against the real issues of life and death, then these uh, superficial things that divide us, uh, things such as the, the pigmentation of our skin, and the other things that we sometimes permit to serve as barriers, uh, those lines begin to disappear, and we realize then that the things that unite us and the things that we have in common in, in, as human beings are so much more fundamental and so much more basic. And so I'm uh, indebted for the opportunities that I've had in, in recent years to come in touch with many kinds of people all over the world and to learn that we all have basically the same hopes and aspirations, that the uh, tears of a mother in one part of the world are about the same as they are anywhere else, that we share many basic goals in common and that we can reach those goals only as we cooperate through the great agency of the United Nations and the other uh, facilities that are made available to us to make cooperation easier and more effective. Now I want to leave just this one final thought with you tonight. I'm not the uh, main speaker here by any means tonight. I feel a little bit guilty talking this long after the short speech by our great uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Mr. Brannan. But I did want to leave just this one thought with you. We've had a great deal of discussion on the floor of the Congress the last few weeks about the subject of economy. And one of the programs that is coming under fire most intensely because of this economy drive is our foreign aid program. It seems to me that if it becomes necessary uh, for political reasons or for whatever cause, for the Congress to reduce appropriations for aid for our friends in other lands, that surely we ought to see to it that that cut comes in the field, first of all, of military aid, rather than in this all-important matter of economic and technical assistance. Now, I don't uh, claim to be an economist, but it has always seemed a puzzle to me that at a time when here in this country and in other parts of the world, governments and political leaders are worried about farm surpluses, it seems awfully hard for me to understand why we uh, are concerned about that problem at a time when two out of three of all the people of the world still do not know what it is to have enough to eat. Now, I realize that there are complicated trade problems, that there are problems of diplomacy, that there are other related uh, economic issues that make this problem a little more difficult of solution than it might seem on the surface. But at the same time, 
I am convinced uh, more each day that if we have the intelligence and the imagination to uh, unlock the secrets of the atom, we ought to somehow be able to figure out what to do with farm surpluses when there are millions upon millions of hungry people uh, all across the world. I think that one of the finest programs that has been worked out by the Congress uh, in recent years is this so-called public law uh, 480, which has as its purpose the use of American farm surpluses and agricultural surpluses in the development of the economy of foreign uh, nations that are in need of those surpluses and nations that we desire to help with our uh, economic and, and technical assistance. So I want to uh, give you my own conviction and my own personal word that uh, while I believe uh, in economy and government, I do not believe in economy at the expense of human welfare. And I'm going to do what uh, little I can as a member of the Congress to work toward the use of America's agricultural abundance in solving, at least in part, this number one problem of the world, the problem of poverty that confronts us on every hand. Uh, thanks ever so much for this brief opportunity to address you tonight. I hope I'll have an opportunity to visit with many of you personally before we leave here this evening. Thank you very much, Congressman McGovern. I feel we're highly honored here today and at this time, at this program, to have with us the President of the International Federation of Agricultural Producers. He served this organization well for one term, and he was just re recently at this last conference re-elected to a second term as President of this Federation. So it gives me, and he's also a farmer from New Zealand. He was telling me today that he's quite a sheep grower over there. So uh, he's really a dirt farmer. So it gives me a lot of pleasure at this time to present to you the president of the International Federation of Agricultural Producers, John Andrew of New Zealand. John. President Upstall, Senator McGovern, it is my... Congressman McGovern. <laughs> it is my privilege and my pleasure on behalf of the delegates of IFAP representing 35 million farmers throughout the world to thank you for all you have done for us today. We have had a wonderful time we have seen a great deal of your countryside, both from the air and from the ground. We have visited two farms. We were particularly hospitably entertained this morning. We enjoyed the drive through the city, even against the red lights. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come and meet you to hear of your problems, to discuss things with you, and I think you will all agree with me that what Congressman McGovern says is largely the view of many of the people whom we represent. The United Nations that is associated with the uh, uh, entertainment tonight is one that most of us support. And between us, I think, we will further the cause that we seek to serve, that of bringing peace and more prosperity to the world. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity of expressing our thanks to you for all you have done to us. Thank you, Mr.